Uh, we will start with the first speaker, who is Barbara Ruel. Barbara is today head of the Competence Center for Nutritional Products in Biomin. Barbara graded, um, graduated from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. Uh, and as you can expect, Barbara, her background is animal nutrition. She's a nutritionist and will give us a presentation to the topic efficient resource management diet dietary solutions in swine. Please welcome Barbara. Thank you, Franz. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me opening here the second part of the swine, uh, swine session. And as mentioned by Franz, my topic is efficient resource management dietary solutions. If we talk about efficient resource management, we have to take a look to our or on our business environment, because this is hardly influencing our business. So most of the points have been touched uh, from the speakers before, so there is no need to go to mention it and to go through. So I will skip this slide. So major driver of the production costs in pork production are the feed costs. Feed costs are accountable for 60 to 70, sometimes more, of the whole production costs. And the protein costs are accountable for uh, 40 up to 50 percent of the costs. Also, we are now looking back the, uh, the last six months in a phase where the prices for the commodities went down, so for corn and for soy, we are still in a high price phase. So if you look at this chart from AFAO showing the prices compared to 2002, 2004, which here are 100, and now looking on the blue line where we are now with oil meal, so soya meal. By nature, producers, feed millers, are looking for soy alternatives. Here's a list of the most important ones, I would say. Important is to consider if we use higher amounts of these soy alternatives, of byproducts, diet formulation gets more complex. And a broad understanding of the feeding stuff is required, and we have also to consider limitations of use, because not each feed material can be used like soy. There are a lot of limitations of use, the protein quality, digestibility, anti-nutritional factors, just to mention a few of that. And there is also the nutrient variability, which is we have to deal as nutritionists. Here's an example from different uh, samples of DDGS from the US, from the Midwest, and just highlighting, highlighting the most important nutrients. Crude protein, here the range is, the minimum level they found is 27.3%. The maximum level they have found is 33.9%, meaning on a complete feed, this could be plus minus 1% protein. So this is a lot. And this holds also through for all the other, um, for all the other nutrients. So there is really a demand for a standardized nutrient specification of the raw materials. If we don't use the feed materials in a proper way, Feed intake can be go down, the digestibility can be affected, gut health can be affected, and finally, the performance can go down. Furthermore, using high amounts of byproducts, soy alternatives, we have also to think about env environmental emissions. How do these raw materials affect nitrogen emission, phosphorus emissions, and how do these raw materials influence the meat quality? For example, if we are using higher amounts of raw materials with high uh, contents of unsaturated fatty acids, like DDGS do. Digestibility is key, so this must be the goal for a nutritionist, and not doing 
least cost formulation, so looking for the cheapest price per kilo feed. In some, reason, uh, in, in, uh, in some regions in the world, they still feed a surplus of protein. If we do that, we have to consider that only 30 up to 45 percent of the nitrogen intake is really retained. The rest is excreted. Formulation on ideal protein, on digestibility, uh, on digestibi uh, digestible uh, amino acids is a must, should be standard. Low digestibility of the diet results in a suboptimal feed intake, so the feed conversion, uh, feed conversion rate is going down. It stresses the animal. It, uh, it forces uh, imbalances of the intestine, and in the end, inflammatory processes can be enhanced, and as well, the turnover of the intestinal tissue can be enhanced. And these processes are consuming extra energy, energy and protein, which are in the end missing for, uh, for performance, for growth. So key must be to support gut health. And this brings me to the dietary solutions, to feed additives, to feed processing, which can help to improve the digestibility of the feed and which can help to improve the efficiency of the feed. First of all, I'd like to mention phytogenic feed additives. In general, phytogenic feed additives have two main properties. First of all, there is the flavoring effect, the sensory effect, the effect on the palatability, and secondly, there is the effect on the digestive tract. With increasing digestive secretions having an effect on the morphology of the gut, influencing the digestibility of the protein and the uh, utilization of energy, it is known or described that phytogenics can stabilize the intestinal microbiota and they are also described to modulate inflammatory processes in the digestive tract. Here's a trial showing you the effect on the digestibility improvement on protein, fat and starch. This is a trial done in piglets in the growing phase. Duration it was here 41 days. And as you can see here, there is a significant improvement of protein digestibility, so by 9.8%. Also, crude fat digestibility is improved, was improved in this trial, and the starch. Same trial, going a bit deeper to the ileal digestibility of amino acids. As you can see here, throughout all, uh, all single uh, amino acids, there is a better digestibility. The green bar represents the control group and the green bar represents the group with the phytogenic feed additive. Here is another, uh, another si a slide showing you the effect of a special phytogenic preparation on the inflammatory um, uh, process in the digestive tract. If you look here on the, le uh, on the left figure, we see here uh, isoleukin 8 and other cytokines being a kind of indicator for inflammatory processes. And here you can see the light gray bar is the negative control without any inflammation. The dark gray bar is the control group with an inflammation, so an inflammation is induced. This was an in vitro test model. Uh, model, and here the green um, is representing the group with an inflammation, including a special phytogenic feed additive. And what you can see here in the group where the inflammation was induced, this marker for an inflammation is increased, and on the other side, where the phytogenic feed additive is used, it could be downregulated. And on the other side, we see here uh, markers which are indicative for gut protection. And here 
grey again the control group, and here in green the group with the phytogenic feed additive, what you can see here, these gut protectin protection markers are upregulated. In the end, it can be concluded that this special uh, phytogenic preparation is modulating inflammatory processes in the digestive tract. Next feed, e uh, feed additive I'd like to mention are or is the group of enzymes. First of all, I have to mention the phytase, but this is already widely used, and for me as nutritionists, it's standard in diets for monogastric animals. Then there is the big group of the carbohydrates with the xylonase and glucanase preparation acting on starch and non-starch polysaccharides, uh, polysaccharides, and we know that they really potentially contribute to a better energy utilization of fiber-rich feeding stuff. So they could also contribute to a better, or they can increase the feeding value of uh, byproducts being rich in fiber. And there is a third upcoming group of enzymes. This is the, or this, these are the proteases acting on protein. So far, limited work is done in swine. It's more work done in poultry. But here, a trial, you see here a lot of figures. But to conclude all these figures, there is also an improvement in protein digestibility and an improvement of the digestibility of each single amino acid possible. Beside feed additives, also the feed processing could positive influence the feed efficiency. So here is a trial where they have compared a corn-based diet with a diet based on DDGS, and the content of DDGS in these diets was 30%, and there is a difference, so there is a coarse, medium, and a fine grind that DDGS included. And what you can see here on trimatter, gross energy and nitrogen digestibility, the corn has a better digestibility than the DDGS, but a finer grinding of the DDGS, only of a single raw material in the diet, could increase the digestibility of energy, trimatter and nitrogen. Next, or only expressed in metabolizable energy, again, the same trial. To conclude, in the end, it is possible to increase or it is possible f uh, to better utilize the energy if you find a grind. On the other side, it's extra energy and it's also a potential risk because we know the finer the diet is, the finer the particle side is, the higher the risk is for gastric ulcers for restlessness, flowability issues, dust formation, and for sure it also uh, costs extra money. Heat treatment. One hand, necessity, risk, and opportunity. For soy products, it's necessary to, to do a heat treatment to get rid of the trypsin inhibitors. If you do it in a don't proper way, then it's also affecting the digestib uh, digestibility. Here you can see a comparison of processing quality of different soy production plants in Germany. And what you can see here, there is a huge variation between the samples, between the processing plant, in there eff uh, effectively reducing the trypsin inhibitor capacity. So it could be also a risk, the heat treatment. And on the other side, it could be a good opportunity to increase the feeding value of byproducts, of soy alternatives. Last but not, uh, but not least, mycotoxin manage uh, management. For me, as nutritionist, the two key points are the mycotoxin-related impact on the animal is depending on several factors. Bad environmental conditions, bad sanitary conditions and imbalanced diets make the animal more susceptible for mycotoxins. And the very important thing is even low concentrations, uh, even low contaminations could have detrimental effects on the immune system. The susceptibility for infections is increasing 
and also the efficiency of vaccination programs is reduced, and this was also shown in trials. Due to time reasons, I picked out only two papers and two results. This is one result showing you the effect of uh, deoxynevalenol and fulmonicin contamination on the histology of the intestine. On the left side, you see a healthy jejunum. On, on the right side, you see a jejunum of uh, fulmonicin-treated piglet. And what you can see here are these fusions of the villi. The other result I'd like to show you is the effect of subclinical dosages, again, of DON and fumonicin in piglets, and the effects on the immune response parameters. These results are showing if the diets are contaminated with DON, fumonicin, or if there is a contamination with DON and fumonicin, the immune response is depressed. And this effect is stronger if more than one uh, mycotoxin is occurring in the feed. Here a trial result, so showing the effect against fumonicin. Fumonicin is a mycotoxin which we see, which is of increasing interest, so it is more and more coming, and the occurrence of uh, fumonicin in feed is increasing is mainly a problem in corn, and here is a trial showing on the one hand that, uh, that the fumonicin contamination is decreasing the performance parameters, as you can see here, the red bar, body weight, daily weight gain, feed intake, and as well feed conversion rate is reduced. And on the other side, this trial is showing that with a um, Fumosin, fumonicin esterase, which is a purified enzyme detoxifying fumonicin, the performance parameters are, um, are back again. This is here, this dark green. And on the other side, to measure the effect of fumonicin, of this fumonicin uh, deactivating enzyme is to measure the spinganin spingosine ratio in blood, which is a biomarker for an exposure to fumonicin. And what you can see here is that this ratio is increased in diets containing fumonicin, and again, it is decreased in diets also containing this special enzyme. To conclude, High feed prices put pressure on production costs. Feed resources, meaning the raw materials, need to be used in the best way. We have to consider limitations of use. Optimal health and well-being of the animal is a prerequisite. Gut health is key. Optimizing feed conversion rate is the way to increase production efficiency there is an increasing awareness of envi environmental emissions, and here we have also to use feed additives. Performance, focus is performance. We have to improve the performance. Who is remembering the presentation from my in the in the morning, showing these nice pictures on the left side, the cows grazing, and on the right side, this supermodel. So sorry, I do not remember the name. So performance is key, and also who is remembering the presentation of Marty Matlock, he also said sustainability is improving, the uh, is um improving productivity to meet future requirements. In my opinion, more than one single action is required to improve efficiency, and there is a huge potential of using feed additives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara Ruel. <coughs> so digestibility is key. Gut health and gut performance is key. I'm sure there are some burning questions to uh, the topics Barbara presented to us. Who wants to address one? A quick one? Uh, maybe I can uh, ask Michael. You're sleeping almost here, but uh, <laughs> reading a book now. We discuss a lot about... Um, um, how coarse the feed should be, eh, milling. Maybe what's your opinion about 
the course of the feet. My opinion is it should be as uh, the particles should be as small as the animal can tolerate it without getting gastric ulcers. And the way I see it, it depends a lot on the health of the animal. So when you have a lot of virus uh, infections, you have animals not eating. Uh, so starvation will prolong or promote uh, gastric ulcers. So for me, it's very much a balance on health and on performance. Very healthy herds, we will go lower on, on particle size. What is the question? Or should I comment? <laughs> I, I completely agree. In my presentation, I just showed you what is possible with a smaller particle size, but I'm completely with you. So in cases of gastric ulcers, so better to have the uh, particle size a bit bigger. But in the end, this could be a possibility to improve digestibility of byproducts and only not of the whole feed mixture, only of single feed materials. Okay. Thank you very much again, Barbara, and let's keep our questions for the later Q&A session. Thank you very much, Barbara Ruhl.